Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful to be in your house, to be in your presence, God. Lord, I, I'm thankful, Lord, for the tears on this altar tonight, God. Thank you for your special presence, touching hearts and lives already. God, tonight as we approach your word and open it up, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we'll put our attention and our interest in tonight, God. We'll do our part. And Lord, we know that you'll do your part. you make that word come alive on the inside of us. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction we need for our lives. Motivate us and build our lives in the things of God. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, there are brothers and sisters. Lord, we love them. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we bless all of the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest and Oak Valley for the well on the way for Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God, all the great churches that are out there, the four square denominations, God, and assemblies and victory, God, for the Catholic churches and the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, God, and Messianic Jewish congregations, God, all the churches that name Jesus as Lord that are preaching your gospel. We bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. 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 You can have a seat tonight. Get your Bibles out and go with me to Ephesians, the first chapter. And while you're turning there, I want to talk to you about a subject tonight called acceptable service to God. Acceptable service to God. See, we all have a need for acceptance. In fact, from a very young age, you will find if you talk to children that they're looking for acceptance. Many times if you find that somebody has a problem in their adult life, it was because they didn't find acceptance as a child. They were looking for something from their dad. They were looking for something from mom. They were looking for something, uh, you know, as they grew into their teen years, looking around at friends, looking for acceptance. Many times issues flow from hearts that aren't accepted. Tonight I've got good news for you, and that is that if you are a Christian, if you're born again, and you've given your heart and life to Jesus, and now there's that exchange that's been made. You've given him all of your heart and all of your life, and now you've received all of his heart and all of his life. Now you are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, now you are accepted by Almighty God. Let's take a look at it, Ephesians, the first chapter. We're going to take a look at two verses, verse number five and verse number six. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse number five, starting out, says these words. It says that uh, God, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now stop right there for a second. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, God predestined us. It means he planned this for us. Now I'm not talking about predestination and some are chosen, some are not chosen. No, God wants everybody. Can I say it to you like that? Because the Bible tells me that God is not willing that any should perish. God wants all of us. God wants us to populate heaven. And therefore God's plan for our life was that we would be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ. See, we used to be of our father the devil. We used to come from a different family, from a different seed. But now that we've been adopted as sons, we are born again. We are brought into the family of God, look at this, to himself. That means that God didn't just save you to save you. God saved you to be with you. Why? Because he loves you and he accepts you. He chose you. He predestined you. He, he adopts you. And now he's bringing you to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Do you know that when God thinks about being with you that he smiles? I mean, that blows my mind that almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who breathed and spoke a word and planets existed, who, who named every star, who hangs them on nothing, spins the world and throws it into a rotation around the sun, Builds all the ecosystems and, and, and the different things on this earth, all the different food chains, all the different balances, the moon spinning around so that the waters don't flood the land and everything that's going on with gravity and, and magnetism and all the stuff that's going on on the earth. The God who did all that wants to be with you and he wants to be with me and he likes it. He likes your company. You may not even like your company, but God does. He wants to be with you. That's because he doesn't see you according to you. He sees you according to Christ. Let's take a look at the next verse. 
Verse number six, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's God's ability. See, we, we don't receive praise based on our ability. No, we praise the ability of God. See, this is a God thing. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't clean ourselves up. We couldn't make ourselves accepted. No, God did that by his grace, by his power. Look at this. By which he made us accepted or highly favored in the beloved. That beloved is Jesus Christ. Now you are living in Christ Jesus, and when God looks at you, he sees Jesus all over you. And now you can enter into the presence of God because now you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. So we never have to wonder or worry whether or not we are acceptable to God. We have been made acceptable to God. We've been given entrance to the very throne room. We now call God Abba, meaning Father, or, or we would say it like this, Daddy. And now we have such a close, intimate relationship with God that we could crawl up in his lap and talk to him about anything. We could spend hours just leaning our head against his chest and hearing his heartbeat. We, we could sigh and cry and, and we could tell him our deepest secrets, our inmost desires, and God would love every minute of it. You are accepted. But tonight, I'm talking about acceptable service to God. See, there's a difference between being accepted and doing things that are accepted. Can I give you an illustration of this? I love my children. My children are always going to be my children. They're always my family. Nothing they can do to make them not my children. I will love them to the day they die and then beyond that into eternity, I'll love them. But see, we as parents, even though we love our children, there are times when our children do things that we say that is unacceptable. Are you listening? They, they might be, you know, going and, and asking us, can I have a cookie? And we say yes, and then they go and grab two and shove them in real fast and think that mom and dad aren't going to notice when they're walking around like a chipmunk. Hmm? Unacceptable, son. I told you one, right? See, so there's things that we understand that in the natural, and yet, why do we think it's any different with God? God loves us. God accepts us. But there is a way that we are to serve God. There is a way that we're to live out our lives before God that is acceptable to God. And I don't want just God to be pleased with me based on, you know, the, 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 the surface level stuff. That's entry level. That's, that's basic. I know that God loves me. I know that God, uh, there's nothing I can do to make God love me more, and there's nothing I can do to make God love me less. That's not the issue. I know that I'm forgiven. I know that I'm freed. I know all that. But I want to live a life that at the end of my life, when I die and when I go before the Father, I want to hear, well done. I don't want to hear, well, you're done. Is that right? I, I want to hear you've been faithful over many things, and now I'm going to put you over more. Uh, you, you've done a good job, son. Enter into the joy of the Lord. See, that's the kind of life we all want to live. We all want to live a life that is pleasing to the Father, that puts a smile on his face, not just because we're his kids, but also because he's pleased with our actions, pleased with our activities, pleased with the life that we live, pleased with how we steward the resources that he's put into our lives, pleased with how we do family and how we do life and how we do ministry and how we do uh, volunteering in church and how we do business and how we do finances and, and, and how we do everything. I want God to look at my life and say, that's good, son. That's what it's all about. Yeah, later on in Ephesians, if you want to turn there with me, chapter 5 tells us to walk as children of the light. Ephesians chapter 5, talking about walking or living out our lives as children of the light. And then in verse number 10, it continues the thought. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. See, even though we are accepted in the beloved, we need to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Because there are things that are acceptable to God and there are things that are unacceptable in His eyes. Things that we can do that are pleasing as well as things that we can do that aren't pleasing. We, we can either work with the Spirit of God or we can quench the Spirit of God. Are, are you listening tonight? See, because we, we want to live a life that God is pleased with, that God is on, that God is in, that God is through, that God is doing some great and mighty things in our lives. That's the life we want to live. And when we're all done, God will say, well done. So tonight, a couple of things acceptable to service to God is these things. And I'm going to complete that sentence a couple of times tonight. Acceptable service to God is, first one is this, acceptable service to God is done in the right fear. Acceptable service to God is done in the right fear. Now, what do I mean by that? I got to kind of explain that. And, and, and I, I'll explain it to you this way. There are two kinds of fear that you can find in the Bible. 
and in life, really. Two kinds of fear. The first kind of fear is a terror. It is that you are literally afraid. It's a word that we would call like a phobia. I am afraid of that, and we run in terror from that, okay? The second kind of fear is a different word. It's a different type of fear, and it really conveys the idea of awe or respect, that you have a healthy fear, and therefore you come with just such an awe, such a respect. Uh, let me give you a, a good example of this. That, that the two kinds of fear, if you apply them to the ocean, right? Think about the ocean for a second. The ocean is a powerful place. There have been times where I, as, as a six-foot-tall man, have been in the water at the ocean, and the riptide and the current and then the waves come crashing and all that kind of stuff, where I have been in terror for my life. If that hits me, if that wave takes me down, I ain't getting back up. Hello. And so there is a fear that is associated with the ocean. Now, if I allow that type of fear to run in terror, to be afraid of it, then I will never experience the joy and the pleasure of splashing in the water, uh, of surfing or, or boogie boarding or, you know, body surfing, swimming in the ocean. I'll never experience uh, uh, the joy. Uh, the other day I was there, um, guy, in the month of December with my son, Ty, it's crazy in California. You can go to the beach in December, right, and, and hang out and take your shirt off and stuff and enjoy the warmth of the sun. But we were there, and, I, and, I, and as I got out into the water, I started picking up these shells. My goodness, they were so beautiful. See, if I had a terror of the ocean, I never would have had that experience. I would have been up on the sand, staring, afraid of what could be. But there's another type of fear. There's an awe. There's a reverence. There's a respect. And if I have that awe and that respect, then when I get into the water and I start to sense a riptide, I'm going to stay away from that thing because I know that could take me down the wrong path. I, if I have an awe and a respect, then when I see the waves coming, I'll either duck underneath and swim underneath or I'll jump over it. Why? Because I know that that wave, I, I should be in awe of the power of it and yet respectfully come and, and, and do what I need to do to maintain the right way of staying in the water so that I don't get brought down. It's the same thing with God. See, if you approach God in terror and in fear and you're afraid of God, there is a healthy respect level for God that you, we need to have. The book of Hebrews warns us our God is a consuming fire. And, and, and if under Moses' law and covenant, if, if they died under the mouth of two or three witnesses, then how much worse if we uh, you know, go against the spirit of grace and the blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. And so we know that Jesus said, fear him who can not only kill the body, but cast your soul into hell. And so we understand all that kind of stuff. But God is saying, I, I don't want you to fear me where you run in terror from me. I want you to have a healthy respect and fear where, yeah, you understand who I am. You understand that I can do those things, yet at the same time, you approach me with awe and reverence and respect. In other words, that sort of fear won't bring you down and it won't take you down the wrong path. It'll keep you in a healthy place with God. Are you listening tonight? I was reading in the book of 2 Kings in, in my daily devotions. I go in Old Testament, New Testament. I have different places that I go through each day. And so in my Old Testament devotions, I was reading through, and you know the Bible has some pretty crazy stories in it, right? I mean, you've heard about Balaam and the donkey, right? That in itself is nuts. Uh, Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. That, that's a pretty, pretty crazy story. Uh, even, even Joshua crossing uh, the Jordan River. You know, the Red Sea is, is, is crazy enough, but then you think about water piling up at a certain town. You know, that's, that's a pretty nuts image in the Word of God. But there's some other interesting things that happen. In the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter number 17, if you want to turn there with me. Book of 2 Kings, chapter number 17, let me set the stage for you. The nation of Israel has been wicked from its onset. Every king that's been over the nation of Israel has turned the heart of the people away from serving God. And they have literally gone after idols. They've set up images. They've set up high places. They've burned incense. They've bowed down and worshipped other gods. And even the ones that had a zeal for the Lord ended up turning their hearts away from God and ended up doing the wrong thing. The wickedness continued on and on and on and on. And God warned them and the prophets warned them. And, and, and all these things took place until finally the word of the Lord came to pass because God is long-suffering. God is gracious and kind. He is, he is uh, slow to anger gracious, compassionate, and merciful, and yet the word of the Lord stands true forever, and therefore God is just, and God has to maintain his word. And so God, after a long period of time, now his word comes to pass that if you don't 
hold to my covenant, you will be scattered to the nations. So the nation of Assyria comes in and they take Samaria and, and, and they, they literally take the people captive and they take them out of Samaria into Assyria and they scatter them all over the place. And what they would do is they would take people that they had conquered from other nations and they would switch them into different places so that they could keep control over them. And so the Assyrian government brought people from other nations and they mixed them into Samaria and they brought them to Samaria. Now this is where it gets crazy because the people are just living there, right? And the Bible says because they did not fear the Lord that lions came and started taking down people. That's pretty crazy. In my thinking, you know, I, I just saw a news report. Anybody see the news report about the mountain lion in Los Angeles has like a Facebook page or something like that? That's crazy in itself. You know, I was saying that instead of like liking hikes, it likes hikers. You know, I, I don't know. So anyways, but these lions in, uh, just think about it. You'll get it in a second. It's okay. Uh, but, but in the Bible, here they are, and, and they don't know any different. They've just been living their lives, and here they come to this new land, and all of a sudden lions are coming against them. So they go back to the king, and they tell the king, these people are getting tore up by lions. And it's because they don't know the God of this land. Now, they were treating God like any other God. Like he was just one of the other gods, and he just happened to be the God of that place. And therefore, because they didn't serve him the way that they ought to serve him, that they were getting taken out. And so they feared God because they were afraid of the lions that were coming against them. Against them. And so what they did was they took one of the priests that they had taken out of the land and they sent him back to the land to teach them how they should fear the Lord. Now, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33 and verse number 34. Take a look at it with me. Well, let me turn there. I'm still in Ephesians. 2 Kings chapter number 17. Verse number 33 starts out. It says, They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. Now, I want you to notice something. Up at the overheads, I've highlighted some words. It says, They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals. In other words, their fear of God was a ritual. It was just a Religious experience, it was just going through the motions in order to not get mauled by lions. They were afraid of getting tore up by lions. So they feared God according to the rituals. Look at the very next verse, verse 34. To this day they continue practicing, practicing the former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law and commandment which the Lord had commanded to the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Now stop right there for a second. Now back up to part A of that verse up on the overheads, if you will. Notice it says, to this day they continue practicing the former rituals, okay? This is just a system for them. They do not fear the Lord. Now, now didn't verse 33 say they feared the Lord? Now this one says they do not fear the Lord. You know what he's saying? He's saying on the one hand, they were in terror of the Lord, and on the other hand, they didn't fear, respect, and honor, and reverence God the right way. In our lives, it's no different. If we are going to serve the Lord acceptably, it has to be the right kind of fear. It cannot be that we're in terror or, or we're just wanting some fire insurance, and therefore, I guess I'll pray a prayer, and hopefully that sticks well enough. I'll work on my resume because I don't want to go to hell when all is said and done. And so we come to church out of a ritualistic experience with God, and there's no real reverence, there's no real awe, there's no real respect, and there's no real relationship with God. Come on, somebody, are you listening tonight? See, our relationship with God has to be the right type of fear. It's got to be the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. It's got to be the fear of the Lord which keeps us. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. Those who are in respect and awe and reverence of God. God says, I can trust that one with my secrets. I can trust that one with my heart. I can trust that one with my plan on the earth. I can trust them with my spirit, my presence, and my power. See, we have to fear God the right way. We've got to make sure that it's not a ritual but that this is a healthy fear of God. D.L. Moody said this. He said, A Christian in the world is one thing, and the world in a Christian is quite another thing. A ship in the water is all right, but when the water gets in the ship, it's quite a different thing. 
See, we got to be careful that we're not fearing the Lord the way the rest of the world says to fear the Lord. That it's not just a system. We do not go to church on Sunday because it's the thing to do. I have lived in places where Sunday was the thing to do, and people would dress up in their Sunday best, and then when I was working at the store as a cashier, they would chew you out in their Sunday best. Let me tell you something. That's not doing them any good. That's certainly not doing me any good, and that is not doing God Almighty any good. That is not a witness, and that's not what we need. We do not need more Sunday Christians who are ritualistically going through the motions with God because they're in fear of the Lord. No, we got to fear and reverence and awe God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Very familiar scripture if you want to turn there with me in your Bible. Look at what it says. Romans chapter 12, back to the New Testament. Great section of scripture talking about fearing the Lord the right way, coming before God with the right fear. Look at what it says, Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not blood of bulls and goats and calves and a commandment because God said to do this. No, you present yourself now, all of your heart and all of your life. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, set apart and separated. And look at the next couple of words, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, when you gave your heart and life to Jesus, reasonable service is everything. Reasonable service is, God, here I am. Reasonable service is, God, I lay me down. I am not my own. I belong to you alone, like we sang tonight. And verse number two, and do not be conformed to this world. Don't let your relationship be rituals. Don't let it be just a system of commandments. Well, I guess because God said, uh, I'll do this because, you know, I, I want to be blessed someday and I don't want to go to hell. No, do it because you love the Lord and because you would just be, be so distraught if you ever hurt the heart of God. How could I do this thing against God? No, I'm going to run from that because I'm going to run to God. I, I won't do that because I love God. See, it's quite a different experience. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, and look at this, an acceptable and perfect will of God. See, God has a will for our lives. God has a way for us to approach Him. God has an acceptable place that we can live life. And God wants us to prove that with how we live for Him. It's got to be according to the right fear. Second thing, if we're going to live a life that's acceptable. We're going to serve the Lord acceptably. We've got to serve the Lord acceptably because it's done in the right way. Not only the right fear, right heart, right motivation here inside, but now in the right expressions of our life. There is a right way to approach God. Pastor Bruce Howard tells a story of a Muslim in Africa who became a Christian. Some of his friends asked him, why have you done such a thing? He answered, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the road forked in two different directions. You didn't know which way to go and there at the fork were two men, one dead and one alive. Which one would you ask to show you the way? See, our, our life with Christ is not a dead faith. We don't have a dead Jesus. He's not in the grave any longer. He is resurrected now. He is seated at the right hand of God. He ever lives forever and ever. Now he sent his spirit into our hearts. He is our counselor. He is our comforter. He is our teacher. He is our guide. And therefore, you don't have to wonder, is this the way of God? See, that's why we can prove that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That, now, now, now I've got to clear something up for a second because I've heard it taught that there's three wills of God. There is the good will of God. There's the acceptable will of God. Like, I guess it's okay for you to do that. I really didn't like that, but I guess I'll let you do that. And then there's the perfect will of God. Okay? Can I tell you something? That's like me saying uh, that car was blue, fast, and, and, and smooth, right? And they'd say, well, that's three different cars. There's a blue car, a fast car, and a smooth car. No, it's three aspects of the same car. In the same way, I believe that this is the three aspects of the will of God. The will of God is good, the will of God is acceptable, and the will of God is perfect for our lives. And we will prove that out. The proof is, is what happens in our life. And therefore, as we tap into the presence of God, and as we come before the throne of God, and we look at our King Jesus, Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus lived a spotless, sinless life. Now, did he have problems? Sure. Did things happen that God did not want to happen? Of course. Do you think God wanted Jesus to go to the cross? Do you think that that was 
oh, that, this is where the argument comes from, that was the perfect will of God. Well, listen, we understand that it was the perfect will of God because he went to the cross of his own accord. But it wasn't, if we would have said in, you know, if, if it could just be the way that we would want it to be, we would have said, well, Adam and Eve would have never sinned and we all just would have served the Lord forever and ever. But because we live in a fallen world and a fallen system, we now have to watch the way Jesus lived. We have to look at the way Jesus responded to, to trials and to suffering and to pain. And therefore, we follow him in that way. We need to see how Jesus loved people. He loved people that were unlovable by society. How he responded to people that, that, that were trying to take him down a road that he shouldn't have gone. How he came up against the devil. How he fought spiritual warfare. Everything that we see in Jesus, we can understand that is the will of God for my life. That is the way that God wants me to go. And I can walk in that way because Jesus is alive and he's the one showing us the way. It's kind of cool in the book of Acts. So you're there in Romans. Turn back with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 10. Kind of a neat story. Peter has gone down to the house of Gentiles. This was unheard of for the Jews to do this. He's gone in and he's preached the gospel to them. They receive by faith. They get filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and prophesying. Peter says, my goodness, if these guys have the gift of the Holy Spirit, what's, what's stopping them from being baptized in water? So he baptizes them in water and then he comes in, Acts chapter 10, Verse number 34 and verse number 35. Acts chapter 10, verse number 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. This is when he's preaching the gospel to them. And look at what he says. Verse number 35. But in every nation, whoever fears him, remember we just talked about fearing him the right way, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, that word righteousness has stirred up a lot of controversy in, re in recent years. Because people have said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, you are. I am accepted in the beloved. Yes, you are. But because of your position, there also has to be a practice. There has to be an outworking of your faith. In other words, faith without works is dead. We learned this this past week. And there has to be a release of your faith. And, it, and it's released in what you say. And it's released in what you do. Therefore, here Peter comes and he says, whoever fears him... Okay? That's that reverence, that awe, that respect of God. But not only fears Him, but also who works righteousness. Not only a position in Christ, but also a practice. You are working at what is the right thing based on what God says. See, God wants us to do life His way. And God has shown us the way in Jesus Christ. You remember uh, back in the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel, right? Cain uh, brings a sacrifice. Abel brings a sacrifice. Cain brought of uh, the fruit of the ground. And, and, and then Abel brought uh, of the, the flocks of his herds. And so here they are. And, and one of the sacrifices accepted. The other one is rejected. Now, why is that? Well, because we know that God accepts a blood sacrifice. There had to be an innocent life given for a guilty one. And so therefore, they would have learned that from Adam and Eve, their, their parents. Adam and Eve would have passed down that to Cain and Abel, and they would have said, we're going to bring a sacrifice before the Lord, and God's acceptable sacrifice is blood. So here they come with their offerings before God. One brings of, of his labors, the other one brings of something that was given to him. And God says, Cain, I can't accept this. This is of the ground, this is of the earth, this is your effort trying to get to me. But he, well, look at what he says. Cain's countenance fell. He's angry. And the Lord goes to Cain and he says, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And yet sin lies at the door. And his desire is to rule over you, but you should rule over it. See, in our lives, we have the opportunity to try and approach God and to do life our way or to do it God's way. Now, we understand that if we do my will, my way, that that's just flat out rebellion. But when we try and do God's will my way, that's disobedience. In other words, I know what to do, but I'm going to try and do it my way instead of doing it God's way. That means we are disobeying the commandment of the Lord. But see, God doesn't want us to do my will my way. Neither does God want us to do God's will my way. God wants us to do God's will God's way. Are you listening? That's obedience. And that's a life that can be blessed by the Lord. See, we could say, well, I want to I bring, you know, tithes and offerings in the house of God. And so we go and we cheat on our taxes in order to bring a bigger return. See, that's God's will, 
my way. And God says, no way. That's not going to work, right? Same thing with the Word of God. Every area of your life. You could say, I'm going to get my family submissive as a man. See, the Bible says, right, anybody who wants to be a leader in the church, they've got to have a family that's lining up with the things of God. Family must be in order. If the family's not in order, how can they, uh, you know, be rulers over the house of God? And, and so here could be a man doing, wanting to do God's will and yet beating his family over the head, beating up his kids, tearing into his wife, putting everybody down, shouting, yelling, all that kind of stuff. See, that's God's will, my way. And God says, no way. You're a jerk. Okay? Stop it. How about love? How about kindness? How about correct and proper discipline? Right? Little teeny tiny rod on the highness. Right? Bam! Right there. It, it's all good. You don't have to beat them. You don't have to bruise them. It doesn't have to be some big mean thing. No. You give them a quick discipline. You talk to them about it. And then you reinforce it with love. That's what God wants for our lives. And that will get them in line with the things of God. See, we need to do God's will. God's way. The only way you're going to find that is in God's word. Getting acquainted with the word of God. Remember how I started this section is that Jesus shows us the way. Jesus is the living word of God. And as you encounter God's word, you will encounter God's son. And he will show you the way. Holy Spirit teaching you and leading you and guiding you. He's going to show you. And listen, it's not always fun. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes you realize things about yourself. My goodness, I'm messed up. I need to make some changes. Can I tell you as a pastor, over the past decade of pastoring, there have been multiple times every year where I'm studying the Word of God and God has just went, you know, and just like, oh my goodness, God, can I just put this down for a second and walk away? You know, it's not always fun when God deals with your heart. And yet God is wanting us to get in line with His will, His way, so that our lives can be acceptable before Him. Are you listening tonight? Praise God. Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight, and we'll end with this. Acceptable to service to God is, number one, done in the right fear. Number two, it's done in the right way. Number three, it's done by the grace of God. See, thankfully, we don't have to do this on our own. Thankfully, we don't have to go out this and give it our best shot, and hopefully we're going to make it. No, God doesn't only tell you what to do. God doesn't only tell you how to do it. God also gives you the power and the strength, his grace. You know what grace is, right? The definition we have for grace, if you know it, say it with me. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Okay, that's not a lot of you guys, so maybe you guys need to learn this. But if you're going to live a life of faith, live a life following God, live a life that's pleasing to God, God, can't do it in your own power. Couldn't even save yourself in your own power. You had to have God save you. And the Bible says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. See, grace is the ability of God on our behalf. So through that vessel of faith, the grace of God reaches out and brings us into a position with God where we're acceptable before him. And now we can have a relationship with him. Same thing if we're going to live a life. If our life and our day deeds and our days and, and, and our labors are going to be acceptable before God, it can't be because uh, just me, right? I'm going to run out of steam. I'm going to run out of energy. I'm going to run out of gas. And therefore, the grace of God comes in. And when I can't do it, God's ability gets the job done on my behalf. So let's try this again. You heard the definition. Try and say it with me if you, if you, if you can pick it up. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Let's try it again. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. One more time while I drink some water. You guys go ahead. Grace. You guys are good. You got it. You got it. I like Pastor Deborah's uh, definition as well. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. See, it's the ability of God on our behalf when we can't do it. God shows it to us. God wants us to do it. And then God empowers us to do it. And the more and more you tap into God, you see the Apostle Paul said, I did all and Christ did all. I worked and I labored, but it wasn't just me. It was the grace of God in me. Last verse for tonight, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Turn there with me if you will. On Sunday mornings, we just started Hebrews, the 11th chapter, three weeks in, and we haven't even got past the first verse. Praise God. So Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we'll be here in a couple years, apparently. <laughs> kind of towards the end of the 12th chapter, verse number 28. Look at what it says. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence. There's that 
reverence, that awe, that respect, and godly fear. See, this is all connected in the Word of God. I want you to notice up on the overheads, I highlighted the first couple of words there. Let us have grace. Did you know that that's a choice? That means that you can choose whether or not you're going to have grace. Because let us means, let's do this. You either can or you can't. You can either choose to tap into the power of God or you can choose to do it in your own resources. You can either choose to have grace or to not have grace. But you need to make the right choice. Make the right choice that you're going to, number one, fear God. Not, not in terror running from God. No, in awe and reverence, coming to God in a way that pleases Him. Secondly, that you're going to do it the right way. Not our way, not my way. Not, you know, just because someone else told us. No, because I see that this is God's way. God wants me to live a certain way. And therefore, as I encounter His Word, I find out what the will of God is for me. And now I can live it out. As I lay my life down before the Lord and not do my way, I do His way. And then finally, number three, I can do this by the grace of God. I may not be able to do it in my own strength. I might run out of steam. I might go to the end of my rope. Listen, if you're at the end of your rope, man, let go because that's where God's power and strength begins. And he will lift you up and take you where you need to go. Come on tonight. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. You guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for your attention. Uh, I really do believe that you got something from the word of God. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure before you leave this place that you're right with God. See, we talked about being accepted in the beloved. Talked about giving God all of your heart and all of your life in order to do that. Sometimes people get the wrong idea. They want to approach God and get to heaven their way instead of God's way. And oftentimes I hear statements like this. Well, there's no hell and therefore we're all going to go to heaven. But listen, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible talks about hell in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And I want to make sure you don't go there. Because if you ever made it to hell, you would do anything you could to get out of there. You'd raise your underwear on a flagpole. And yet, there are no exits in hell. And we choose with our life where we end up while we're here on the earth, whether heaven or whether hell. God gives us that free will choice. God loves us so much, and he wants to be with us. And yet, God loves us enough to give us the choice that if we reject him, then he's... He's out of it. He's already done everything he's going to do, and he gives us the opportunity while we're here on the earth, where we go, we choose heaven or we choose hell with our lives. Hell was never intended for you and I. God is not pleased. He's not happy when people go to hell. It's not the intent or the will of God, and yet God loves us so much he allows us to choose. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You know, you do whatever you want to do. I'll do whatever I want to do as long as we stay true to ourselves. Yeah, the church is out there. They can do their thing. God, God appreciates that. And, and, and whatever you call heaven, we're all going to end up there somehow, some way. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven? That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You're not going to make it to heaven. And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Don't you think after all that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does. Right here in his word. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I know that, you know, you get to heaven because you're good. Don't good people go to heaven? I've been really good. I've been working on my resume, you know, and, and trying to, you know, I heard one guy on television say it like this. Uh, because I did these good things, I'm going to get a seat a little closer to God. Can I tell you something? That's utter foolishness. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that your good works will get you a seat closer to God. Come on now. That's foolishness. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your good works get you to heaven. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nowhere in the Bible will you find your goodness is going to get you there. Because we're not perfect. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. Going to get thrown out. Not going to get to make it. Not going to get to stay. Now, some of you in this room might be thinking, but wait a second, Pastor, I was raised in church. My parents told me you're Christians growing up. They hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized a Christian as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class or maybe even Sabbath school class. And you're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does it say, you raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. 
God doesn't look at your life and say, well, I guess they're not anything else, so I'll, I'll just lump it in the, into the category of being a Christian. And you get to go to heaven because of that. Come on. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can sit in church and call yourself a Christian any, any more than you can sit in your garage and call yourself a car and that makes you a car? No, just a person sitting in your garage. You can't just sit in church and call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second because, you know, my last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where that gets into heaven, could you? Because that's back to good works. It's back to you trying to be good enough to get into heaven. God's not counting up your volunteer hours or checking for membership cards at the gate to heaven. It's not going to make it. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Come on, let's not play games with God. Some of you said, but pastor, hold on a second, because I know God. I mean, I, I could quote scriptures to you. I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know God? Well, can I ask you a question? Have you read your Bible? The Bible says the demons know who Jesus is. They're not Christians. They don't get to go to heaven. The Bible, of course, the devil himself can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is in your head, but rather this is about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, but can I explain to you what it means from the Bible? Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all, all of your heart and all of your life. I've said it several times already tonight, but it's worth repeating. You've got to give God all of your heart and all of your life. As you do, he comes into your heart and you are born again, brand new. That old man's gone and now you can live accepted in the beloved like we talked about. That doesn't happen because you've been good, because you were raised in church, because you volunteer, because you know God. That happens when you give God all of your heart and all of your life. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying, lukewarm? What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be, but let's push past that tonight. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? And no one make that train. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of this right now. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell forever and ever and ever. And listen, no one's judging, criticizing, condemning you. We've all done this at one point or another in one way or another in our lives. Now it's your turn. We're excited for you. Will you give God all your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight is your night of salvation. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to get your hand up. Or finally, who should raise their hand in a moment when I pop my hands together? If you're lukewarm, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at watching my television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at all over the world. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God knows. And then you can either click the blue button that says how to know God or on our homepage, how to respond to God. And someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Eight, nine. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? There's ten up there. I got you over there. Thank you. Ten wise people on this side. Ten wise people. Uh, Eleven. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. 
Who else? I got you, man. Thank you. You can put your hand down if I already saw you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's 11 wise people. We're at number 12. Thank you. Got you right there. Come on, number 13. Where are you at? Anybody else real quick? Just raise up your hand. Thank you, number 13. Got you right there. Anybody else? Praise God. About 13 wise people. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, you should. Let's go for it. Come on, who else tonight? Thank you, number 14. Thank you, number 15. Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Excuse me. All 15 of you, here's what I want you to do. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend, if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle, and I want you to meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You just come right now. Make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on down. Jesus, I believe in you. And Jesus, I belong. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe in you. They're coming. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just come to the front right now. From the family rooms, if you raise your hand, you can bring your children down. Come on down right now. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. All right. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys up front. This is the best decision of your entire life. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You can put a smile on your face, all right? You made the right choice. Best decision right here. Right over here to my right, your left, this guy waving at you. This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? I'm about as weird as you're going to get tonight, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. You're not wondering or worried, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, accepted in the beloved. You're going to be in Christ, and Christ is going to be in you. Brand new creation, and now you've got access to God, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next, okay? It's easy reading, and it's free. And then finally, number three, he's going to give you a friend we have here in the church. We like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back, serve the devil, right? That old family, that old man. No, but that you go on in the new way with God, serving God acceptably like we talked about tonight, okay? It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. Now listen, I want to make a promise to you guys. Give us one year consistently sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. If you can come every Wednesday night, hey, every Wednesday night for one year, get into church as much as you can. Maybe you can come Sunday mornings. Maybe you can come Saturday mornings. Maybe you can come Sunday nights or Thursday morning, the women's Bible study. Maybe you're a young adult and you can come to Friday night for the, the, the young adults ministry at seven. Hey, lots of ways to get into the word. But just for one year, consistently and, and as much as you can, get into the word of God here at the rock. And for the rest of your life, here's the promise. After that year, I promise you will look around and say, man, I did not know it could be this good. I am so blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Okay. All right, there you go. Take their word for it, okay? It all starts with an SPT. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, 
that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.